All right, so we have been listening live to this video of an interview that was uh, videoed with with Millie and it is just absolutely heartbreaking what we've been hearing. Um, also listening right now is Alora Nanos, our law and crime legal analyst. And Alora, you've been listening to this alongside with me here. I mean, this is just awful and her ability to retell these stories and these details is really incredible. It absolutely is, Angelica. Uh, really, if there is any justice in this world, it's going to be that the words of this four-year-old are going to put these people in jail for life. She is unbelievably articulate. She's telling a, a, an unusually coherent story for a four-year-old. Um, she's making perfect sense. Her, her dialogue seems very natural. Um, and she's telling a story that is highly believable, which is kind of unusual for such a small child. Uh, but it is nonetheless beyond heartbreaking. Yeah, absolutely. And we want to continue to listen to that. So we're going to take a break right now. When we come back, we'll play you the rest of this live from the Rosenbaum trial courtroom. All right, so we've been listening to this interview of Millie. This is the detective that interviewed Millie after she had made an outcry. Um, this happened after Layla died when she was with another family, but they had to go in and interview her. And of course, they then began asking other questions. And as we just we talked about a little bit, Millie is incredible in her way to just tell this detective what happened. Um, Alora, what you know, what are you thinking when you when you see this? What are they what are they trying to get at by playing us this interview? Well, I mean, I think that, that there's really a double goal here and, and the prosecution is is meeting that goal on both fronts. First of all, it is obviously completely heartbreaking to hear this little voice talk about the death of her sister and ongoing abuse is you know, even the hardest heart. Um, would would just be softened by just how sad that is. So it has major, major emotional impact. But beyond that, it's also telling a, a pretty coherent and cohesive narrative. Um, Millie is really unusually articulate for a four-year-old. She sticks to what she's saying. She's clear about what she's what she's saying. She's answering these questions directly, and it makes it you know, that much more heartbreaking that this happened because had anybody looked into this early enough, this child probably would have reported what was going on in the foster home. Um, but she's doing a great job. She's a great historian, this child. And uh, it's not going to go well for these defendants in large part because of what she's saying. All right, Alora Nanos, thank you so much. We're going to take a quick break. When we come back, we'll continue to follow this trial. Stay with us on Law and Crime. And welcome back to the Law and Crime Network. Um, we've been listening to a recording of an interview with Millie. This was conducted by a detective after Layla's death, and it has just been absolutely chilling to listen to this young, young child telling the story and recounting things that she experienced. She talks about injuries and the bruises. Um, Alora Nanos is joining us here, our law and crime legal analyst. Alora, you know, one of the things that you've said uh, off off camera to me about this is how incredible it is that she's able to answer these questions like an adult and just just basically sit there so composed yeah and it's not even just that her emotional state is composed because um you know young children often even who have gone through major tragedy um, they do tend to kind of recover from that and and live very much in the moment but it's more kind of cognitively and verbally that this child is communicating like a much older child. Um, she's, she is seems to be understanding uh, some kind of sophisticated language coming out of the detectives. She's responding appropriately. She doesn't seem to really hesitate or seem confused. Um, I have not one time yet heard her answer a question other than the question that was put to her. Uh, very typically small children, even when they're trying to cooperate, misunderstand questions or um, kind of answer about tangential issues and, and are, are not focused on the question before them. And it, it's really interesting here. Uh, I'm seeing nothing that indicates that she's coached in any way, but she just seems to be just able to handle uh, you know, high-level verbal communication in a way that is kind of atypical for a four-year-old. 
Right. It's just incredible. And I'm told they're playing more of this interview of the recording. So let's go back live and listen to that. All right, so just more of that interview with Millie and the detective, and wow, that is just really, really interesting and honestly a little hard to listen to. Alora, you know, one of the things about this trial is we heard Millie in the courtroom during her testimony, and now bringing in this additional sort of interview type of setting with her, we're hearing more from her, more of her voice. How does that play into all of this by adding and giving, you know, more supplemental stuff from Millie? Well, it's basically saying this is the most credible witness we have uh, in terms of someone who is directly in the house during these children's lives with these two foster parents. So, uh, you know, it's shoring up the prosecution's case. I mean, frankly, this probably would have been a strong case even without this child. But with the child, I mean, it's, it's practically airtight. I, I don't see any way that these defendants are going to come out of this um, without a guilty verdict because this child's testimony and, and this tape is so airtight. She's not even doing the typical thing that children often do, which is to kind of just agree with questions, um, you know, when, when, when she's kind of in a rhythm. Every time one of these detectives says something to her and questions her about something that didn't actually happen, she goes, no, that's not what happened. She's clearly paying attention and she's answering accurately, um, at least in her mind accurately, and she's really drawing that distinction between when the interviewers are getting it right and when they're not. And I think that's huge in this case. Yeah, and talking about that detective and the questions that he's asking, I mean, he's got to be kind of delicate here. You know, you hear him sort of heighten his voice and try to talk, obviously, because she is a child. Um, but that's got to be hard for someone to do that. Oh, this is no question. I mean, this has got to be one of the most heartbreaking jobs in the world to have. Uh, I am a former child abuse prosecutor, and whenever I tell that to people and, and I get, you know, the sad look about what a heartbreaking job it must have been, the very first thing I say is, well, I, I wasn't a social worker or an investigator, so my job was never to look into the eyes of the children that had been there at the hands of abuse. Um, to me, that is the hardest job a person could have, is working directly with children who have been victims of abuse and neglect. And to know that you're questioning and, and having to delicately uh, deal with a child who has suffered um, for the purpose of getting justice for a sibling who has died, uh, I, I really can't even think of anything worse. Yeah, absolutely. All right, Alora, as you can see, this trial is still continuing live. We want to take you back there. We're going to take a break. We'll go back live to the Rosenbaum trial after this. All right, so we've been hearing more from that detective, him answering questions about that interview um, from both the prosecution and defense. Um, Alora Nanos, I want to bring you in because you are a former children's services prosecutor, so you can help us break down a lot of the things that we've been talking about with this case from the beginning is the fact that there were shortfallings and shortcomings here with the defects. And... Um, you know, people are kind of saying that they, you know, some of the uh, interviews here allege that they are to blame. People were fired. Um, how does that play into all of this? Are they to blame? So, well, well, first of all, no. They're not to blame for a murder. The only people to blame for a murder are the people that committed it. So assuming that the facts that we believe here are true are actually true, the people to blame are these parents. Now that doesn't mean that there's not, you know, some some thing to uh, to really look at for children's services. Now, you know, ultimately the cause of the death is the people who directly caused it, but it makes it so heartbreaking to know that perhaps this could have been avoided. Um, but you know, I mean, ultimately children's services are no more responsible than the police are responsible for failing to prevent a crime. But it does sound like there is significant kind of negligence on the part of children's services going on in this case. And one of the things that I would really want to know about to understand, you know, how bad of a job did they really do uh, is to understand how it is that these children got to be with the foster parents. Because my understanding of the case is that the children were voluntarily placed with these foster parents. In other words, the mother had got to wrap up quickly here. Sure. Okay, so the mother essentially was the one who placed the children with these All caretakers. All right, Alora, I've got to cut you off. I'm sorry. Alora Nanos, thank you so much for joining us. Stay with us here on Law & Crime. Rachel Stockman's coming up next.